Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of the Next in Time podcast. I'm your host, ST, and today our guest is none other than James Hutchinson, who is the founder and CEO of Hyperlift. Hyperlift represents a radical innovation in vertical transportation through creating the next generation of elevators. Dubbed as the Tesla 4S elevators, Hyperlift, Hyperlift's vis- sorry, mission and vision is to make possible the sustainable vertical expansion of our global urban centers, as well as deliver an unparalleled passenger experience to their inhabitants. So, James, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you for having me, ST. Yeah, I'm glad you're able to come because uh, for our 30th episode of the ne- of this podcast, um, I just want to give you a shout out because if it weren't for you talking about I me, mean, you know, when we first met back like several months ago, you were talking about this grand vision of what you're building. Mm-hmm. Just talking about it. You're the you're the reason why I even came up with the idea of this podcast in general because I realized just talking with you, talking about your really impeccable vision of what you're building, it's like that made me realize you know why can't I just do a podcast of like interviewing different kinds of founders just talking about their visions? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. So well, that's I interesting. Give- you, never, you never shared that with me, but that's great. I was glad that I was able to inspire you to create this podcast. That's uh, that's terrific. Yeah, you're, I mean, just talking about what you've been doing, just you know, you've done all you, the way you just talked about, like this grand vision. Imagine if I just had multiple of those visions just discussed amongst mm-hmm. a lot of people, because people just talk about like, I'm just going to there just to get the money. But I feel mm-hmm. like you're what you're doing right now is doing something much more like, you know, this, this can really make it, this can really radically transform how we, how elevators work in a way. So <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. What we're trying to do is we're trying to disrupt and revolutionize an industry yeah so that's because yeah, i rarely met because i've met a lot of people just who are going to add some changes here and there to something but not like mm-hmm. radically transform like you know like go through the elon musk type of person so mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. so so it's, uh, it's kind of why i decided to you know yeah. let's, ha- let's have you on because you're like you're the grand guest of our of our show yeah we want to make the world a better place with regards to vertical transportation right just like an elon musk vision as you said <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So what, I mean, I'm just wondering, like, is there a re like, how has it been so far with the whole creation? Well, um, you know, I founded Hyperlift back in April of ni- uh, 2019. And, um, you know, we're not the first to come up with the idea of a cableless elevator system. I mean, I think it's been around for decades. But we're really the first to, I mean, the challenge is, is to really come up with a propulsion system to yeah. propel cableless elevators. So I think we're the first to come up with a concept that is, it is able to be, basically be manufactured and be produced in a in a in an inex, inexpensive enough way that we could actually bring it to market. I think other other companies have come up with concepts in the past, but they're very, very complex. They're still very conceptual and and far away from far away from from market. Yeah. So where so do you are you like someone who's very savvy with with these high level like with, with, with these kinds of systems in general? Like you like really like to work on building things from scratch and then making sure they really operate at a very high level capacity? Well, I'm a, I'm a mechanical design engineer from from the beginnings of my career. All through my 20s, I I did mechanical design engineering, but then in my uh in my late 20s, I got into the elevator industry and I've been in the elevator industry for 30 years now with a focus more on business development and project management than engineering, but I've always had this engineering background. Um, so after, you know, 30 years of being in this business and not really seeing much innovation, you know, everyone's kind of doing the same old thing. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, you know, and, and while being in the business, I started out originally working for the major companies. I worked for Otis Elevator Company for several years. I worked for Dover Elevator for several years, two leading companies. But I, I after about 10, 11 years of working for the major companies, I went out on my own and started my own elevator company. So for the past nearly 20 years, I was running my own elevator contracting business. But again, following the kind of the same path as the as the larger companies, just everything was kind of status quo. And as I got kind of later on in my career, I decided I really wanted to do something 
something bigger, you know, something, yeah. something bigger, something with uh, greater rewards. Um, and so I had this concept of, uh, of a tractive drive system that would replace cables in elevators. And so I kind of made a pivot and decided that I would start working on, and on this company that I called Hyperlift. And so for a little while I was working on, I was involved in two companies. I was running a, what my contracting business, which was called Precision Elevator. And we were doing, focusing mostly on elevator modernization work. But at the same time, I was beginning to build Hyperlift. And I got to a point where I was actually using the profit money from Precision as seed capital to get Hyperlift off the ground. And fortunately, we were able to secure an, an SBIR phase one grant, which was a quarter million dollars to build a proof of concept. Right. And so what was great about that is that was kind of like the shifting point. That was where I decided that I was going to go all in on Hyperlift and work on this prototype. So I, I sold my other business, Precision Elevator, and focused on building my team and building this, pr this prototype using right. the NSF grant money. Oh, and yeah. so that project was successful. So we're approaching, we're, we're now moving on to our phase two, uh, phase two of the project. And we've, uh, we've just been granted another uh, phase two grant from the S um, from so the uh, like National the, Science Foundation. The, yeah. The NSF, they really have faith in you in terms of really making this change. They, they do. They do. It's not easy to get these, these SBIR grants there. There's a very serious uh, vetting period that uh that you have to go through they they vetted us for eight months prior to awarding the uh the phase one grant yeah and also um let me just get to know more about you i mean i, I think you've given like a lot of explanation of what how you got into hyperlift but i want to get to know more about james the engineer like how what made him what how did you become the engineer that you are even currently today well again early on in my career in my 20s or maybe, um, maybe like maybe back so like circle back to your childhood let's say more about like oh my childhood well i was a big fan of legos for <laughs> one um i used to build i had tons and tons of legos um and i used to build these things out of lego uh in my basement we had this we had this pool table in my basement that was torn up like the top was torn so we couldn't use it for as a pool table so i used it as a as a basically a a play table and i would build these huge um cities and things like that out of lego and i would get my brothers to come down and i'd explain it to them like what i you know what i built and how it worked and and all that and i i and so i think i think that's really where my 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 engineering background uh, began was was building cities out of lego in my basement on this broken down pool table um, it, i used to i used to draw a lot too I, I i like to draw like contraptions and i would show people on the drawing well this is how it works right like the thing something it goes in here and it goes through this and it comes out the other end and i i would i would always draw these contraptions and Nowadays, with the stuff I'm doing now, it's funny because my family reminds me of how I was back when I was a kid. And <laughs> it's, you're, 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 you're someone who was a was like a tinkerer. You don't. You always. You were not someone who likes to read all day. Like you just like to experiment. Yeah, uh, yeah. I was always hands on tinker. Absolutely, to, always wanted to build stuff. Um, was always you know in in had things inside my my head that I wanted to get out on paper or you know or build it in some way. Um, so yeah, that's uh, and 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 I was fortunate too because in in my twenties when I did, you know, uh, you know, receive some training in mechanical design engineering, um, I was fortunate enough to be hired by an early stage robotics startup. Uh, this is back in Princeton, New Jersey, oh, and were... I was uh, employee number one at a at a robotics startup, and I was I was only like twenty three at the time, and I was doing um, a lot of their mechanical designs working alongside uh, another mechanical engineer who was actually one of the one of the founders he was the CEO and he and I did all the mechanical designs for this for this uh, robotic work cell this company ended up going public at some point I had left the company uh I was only there for a few years and I went on to do other things but not long after I left the company went public and I didn't make no I don't think anyone made a lot of money from the company. But the experience that I went away with was not only an ex experience of doing 
mechanical design work, but being involved in a startup, you know, that really kind of stuck with me because yeah, it was exciting. It was exciting. Yeah, like, like startups are one, like being involved in startups, I realized that you have to really be, um, you know, you have to be dedicated, but you will not be you, but you won't be getting much in return. But the one thing yeah. you will be able, but that's guaranteed, is the experience of really working in one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And think about this: this was back in the late '80s, and I was doing this robotics design with a startup. I mean, this is quite a few years ago. So I got away from that when I got in the elevator business. I got away from the design and the whole startup scene. And I was working for elevator companies doing elevator contracting work and project management. But I always had this brain that was a design brain and 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 kind of you know very interested in doing my own thing, being, you know, I'm definitely a serial entrepreneur. I mean, I've always done things, even when I was working for the elevator or working in the elevator industry, I was always doing entrepreneurial things on the side, you know, and and some, you know, some uh some were somewhat successful and some were not, you know, but I was always trying things. Always. I always had, I always had multiple things going on at one time. Yeah. I hear you because I've seen the way you think the way, I mean, especially uh, the way your team operates. I know there's like one member who's more into the technicalities of elevators. One's in design like yourself. The other one is business savvy. The other is, you know, financially yeah. savvy. Yeah, I got a great team. Yeah, you got you got you got the right. Like I see your team. It's like it's very varied in terms of capabilities. Like people have each of them have their own individual capabilities, and but you still manage to find a way to bring them together and make sure you focus on this like mission of what you're building. Yeah, yeah. What's interesting about my team is is, is as you said, St. Yeah, we're we're very different, um, personality wise and and skill set wise, but our combined skill set is exactly what's needed to make this project successful. And what's interesting, I don't know if you know this, but the four of us live together in a four bedroom house in Santa Clara. Yeah. So we all live, we all rented this house together and we live there and our our R&D facility is 5 minutes down the road. <laughs> but you can you can imagine how much discussions take place at the house as opposed to the R&D facility. It, I mean, we, it, it's like you wake up, you just basically what you do is just you go to bed, you wake up the next day and just be like the people you, you see, again, hey, yeah. what's the what's the next what's the status for the elevator? What's the status yeah. uh, with our yeah. grants or what's the status of how is everything going? Are we going for the next pitch or something? Or yeah, yeah we got it. We have a big whiteboard in our living room and we get up and we're making breakfast and we're talking about the challenges of the day. And um, and we come home at night and, you know, <laughs> yeah, make who, ourselves. Who who needs an office when you can just wake up and be with your we, roommates? We, we like don't. We, we really don't have office. We work from the house, or we, or if we need to actually do some physical hands-on development, then we're we're at our R and D facility right down this right down the road. Yeah. So, so it's, yeah, and I and what I, what I've been saying to the guys too, I said, you know what? I think it, someday when we look back, the decision to live together during this this stage of the project. It's going to end up being the one of the biggest factors that made us successful. You know, I really believe that. Yeah, because I can tell, um, you know, if you see a lot of people, like people say when you live together as roommates, you know, people your age, people, they would be like, what, what are you doing at this age? Like, how do you <laughs> combat that negative stigma? <laughs> Oh, you know, it's so much fun living together. I mean, we we all have, you know, some of us have significant others. Um but they're, you know, they're 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 elsewhere, right? Like uh, yeah. our control systems engineer Ozzy, he he has a wife down in um, Riverside, <laughs> so he flies back and forth, you know. And then I have kids. Uh, I'm my I'm family in Honolulu, so um, I fly back and forth to Honolulu occasionally to, to stay connected with them. And Eric, our our product development engineer, he has a place up in um, Dobbins, which is three hours north of where we are, and he's back and forth between there so but we all come together at the house you know and that's where we spend most of our time in santa clara uh you know building building this prototype yeah so tell me about the um so right now i think we got you got we got a lot of information from you as as who you are and what why you why you're building this but let's get to know more about 
the journey in building the first elevator? Like, where is it currently right now? What are you doing in terms of, you know, because you were trying to, because you've said in conversation that you've flown to Dubai to, ret- to test this elevator, if it's going to work in this, in this large building. So do you feel like, let, let's, just go, let's go through that first before I go into further questions. Sure, sure. Well, the reason for our Dubai trip, we, we flew to Dubai back in March of this year, of 2022. And, and the reason for the trip was to connect with uh, some of the large developers there. Dubai represents our, our beachhead market, right? We're, we're ultimately wanting to enter the UAE and Saudi Arabia, places like that. So we flew to Dubai. We had scheduled some um, some meetings with some of the large developers there, such as one of them was uh, Amar Properties, who's the largest uh, developer there. They built the Burj Khalifa. So we met with them. And, and the reason was that really just to kind of get on their radar, to let them know about this technology that was coming. What's interesting is this one developer we met with, uh, DMCC, the guy knew who we were and what we were working on before the meetings but when we when we came into the meeting the first thing he says before we even sit down is it's about time somebody was doing what you guys are doing and we we just thought well what a great way to start a meeting with a with a potential future client right (laughs) but that was the purpose for the the dubai trip but with regards to where we are with the project we we've already successfully built a prototype yeah. And again, that was with our our, our phase one NSF money. Uh, we've just received a, a funding for our second phase, and we're going to build basically a full scale demonstration cab. We expect to have that cab completed and on a beta site in New York City before the end of next year. Right. So we're actually using, you know, we've pivoted our go to market strategy a little bit this year. Well, a lot of bit actually, because originally we were looking at just trying to go right into the Middle East. Um, but now we decided that we're going to actually take our technology and build it into a retro kit, uh, a retrofit product for the elevator modernization market in New York City. Right. So that's our, that's, so we, again, we expect to have a beta site in New York before the end of next year. So, how how is the difficulty in terms of let's say doing all this work to build one elevator how difficult is it yeah it's it's very difficult if i didn't have the team that i have again our combined skill sets are necessary we have a four man team you know a lot of startups are just you know two founders sometimes one founder project like this requires a a, a much bigger skill set that w- it would be almost impossible for one person to have right so yeah. um but with the four of us we have we definitely possess the skill set to to get us uh, uh you know to the next stage but uh but yeah it's 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 very difficult it's i mean we're gonna we're gonna i mean besides our team we also of course have to rely on outside vendors and so forth to um, to help us in certain areas, like one area that we're building uh, that we don't have the inside skill set for is the energy storage system for right. our for our our cab. So we're going to be working with a company that that's their specialty is is developing and building energy storage systems. So we've so besides our team, we've aligned ourselves some with some really good um, really good suppliers that are going to help us um, achieve our mission. And so. What is it like? Let's just say, because you've what you're trying to do in terms of changing the whole elevator system is that you're trying to make sure the elevator runs without cables, right? You're trying to like attach this to like a beam or something where it's like it just shoots up, or, or what's the well, well, what we've done is we, we've we built what we call a dynamic tractive drive system, and this drive system mounts on the cab itself and it allows the cab to engage with the guide rails, so it basically clamps to the guide rails and uses friction and electric motors to basically propel itself self up and down without the use of cables. Now, the value proposition of enabling an, an elevator cab to propel, to self-propel, is that now we're able to put multiple cabs in the same shaft, okay? Right. So imagine an elevator system in a, in, a, in a tall building where you've got upward bound shafts and downward bound shafts with the ability to cross over at the top and bottom. So, so cabs are now able to ride independently in the building and circulate 
in the building. What that right. allows us to do then is, is to reduce the overall footprint of the elevator system dramatically, like nearly in half uh, compared to traditional elevator systems. So in a super tall building, like the ones you have in Dubai, you could easily have 50 to 60 elevator shafts in a building with only one cab in each shaft. So you've got a lot of wasted space. With our system, you don't have that wasted space because you've got multiple cabs running in a single shaft, right? right. So architects and building developers love what we have to offer because we're basically freeing up millions of dollars of real estate inside the building with our system. Are you just looking to like what in terms of the problem you're solving with these elevators like why is it that people would rather like buy your elevators over keeping their old keeping their old elevators because you know if you notice like the the one thing about the old elevators is that throughout time is you know they've perfected the point where you know they can they can you know transport as many people as they can and you know get or get across multiple like floors of a building like why is it that yours is trying is is trying to be better than their than their old elevators. Yeah, it, I mean, it's really again our target market is the is the taller buildings, right? Because that's where our value proposition really begins to shine, and it's it really comes down to throughput. It's a it's about getting more people through a system faster in a smaller footprint, right? Um, you can't do that What's with traditional. This? Like what's the sp average speed that you're looking that you're targeting for the for like when if you ever to go up from let's say the like the ground floor all the way to the fifteenth floor of a building, mm -hmm. like what is the time like what is the speed that you're targeting to get like let's say it's about a couple of seconds to get to the fifteenth floor or, well elevators are typically um, designed to go at a speed relative to the height of the building. So in a 15 story building, which is not a tall building in, you know, compared to the super talls, but a, a 15 story building might have an elevator that only would typically travel like 300 feet per minute. Okay. So it might yeah. only take you, it would take you maybe 30 seconds to get to the 15th floor, but in a super tall building, let's say you've got, say you've got 70 floors, Yeah, an elevator with an elevator in a building with 70 floors is going to be designed to travel probably at like 1200 or 1400 feet a minute where it might take a, a maybe a, a full minute to get to the top floor so 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 elevators are 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 designed you know for each building right yeah. depending on the height of the building and so forth but the 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 i guess the common factor though is that people don't want to spend too much time in the elevator right yeah. so yeah. and typically what it's what 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 it's been said is you you don't typically want to spend more than 60 seconds in an elevator yeah so so when an elevator is designed for a building they'll look at the height and they'll say okay in order to not spend more than 60 seconds in an elevator how fast does the elevator have to go and they'll they'll, they'll install an elevator that goes that fast right and is it going to be more like, why is it that um, you're only targeting like the super tall buildings versus like the regular tall buildings for the elevator? Well, we're we're targeting buildings that are initially thirty stories or greater. Okay, um, particularly when we're looking at New York, but as we shift later on to the international market, we'll be looking at more of the super tall buildings, which will be probably more like fifty or sixty stories are taller and again the reason the reason we're focusing on the taller buildings is because the taller the building the greater our value proposition our biggest value proposition is saving space right so the bigger the building the more elevators the more traditional elevators are needed right the elevator system gets very big as the building gets taller so the footprint gets bigger but that's not the case with hyperlift hyperlift yeah. the footprint does not have to get much bigger as the building gets taller right. the other big the other big value proposition is this is traditional elevators can only travel to a certain height because of the cables so there's height limitations that's why in in tall buildings a lot of times you have to get off at a sky lobby and get on to another elevator to go to the very top of the building oh yeah those kinds of those kinds of elevators are like very tiresome to go into because like, you if you want to like, let's say for example i go to 
I, mean, I, I think I remember when I went to China when I was uh, 19. That was like many years ago now. <laughs> I remember, I think I went to a, I went to a certain level of a build, of the of the Pearl Tower. I think it is there something, or is it some other building, but somewhere. I went up to the, t the top floor, sorry, to a certain floor level, and then I had to switch the elevator to the next floor, to the, to the next phase of the, phase, let's just say the next level of the building. Yeah. Yeah, so, you got you have to get off at a what they call a sky lobby in order to transfer to another elevator to go up to the very top. Uh and it's because the reason they do that is because the 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 cables have a certain height limit before the cables the uh, weight uh, of the cables becomes so heavy that they can't support themselves. Yeah. With hyperlift because we don't have cables, we have no height limits. So we can we don't we don't need so, that means, I mean you could just literally change the whole structure of the elevator just for instead of just having you know two elevators you have to take and it takes a lot of power to operate them and then more cables more resources and more space I think it's also you're trying to condense like make the space more reasonable right for right let's, right just we one elevator go up that's it yeah yeah we're we're saving space number one because the footprint of the elevator system is is much less and we're saving space by also not needing sky lobbies so Got it's it. yeah so it's i mean we're talking millions of dollars per year of real estate that we're freeing up in the building so yes, it's a, it's it's a huge deal for architects and building developers yeah, considering that nowadays more it's more and more people are moving into the cities and um it's yeah. getting like in order to i think would it, would it would it make an like would it cause a massive effect on um these uh would it cause like a massive effect on real estate prices in general if let's say these elevators were put in were put in place and more space would be needed to build more units in the building or something like that was that what you're trying to is that well, what you're I trying think, to see I, I think I the the wave we're really riding I mean the reason we're focusing on the the Middle East and Asia Pacific as our as our ultimate go-to market is because that's where the emerging emerging economies are, right? That's where the, 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 the cities are really beginning to get taller and taller and taller, oh. right? Because you have, you have the urbanization that's happening there, right? People are moving into the cities from the country and they're getting better jobs. They're able to afford nicer places. And so cities uh, are getting bigger. And the concern with cities is that they want to prevent what's called urban sprawl, where which means cities get wide, right? They just get wider and wider and wider. They don't want, they don't want, they want to control urban sprawl. And the way they do that is by by building taller buildings. So yeah, it's just, like for example, the like Doha, Qatar, like the World Cup, because of the World Cup that's happening right now, I think more and more people are interested and then they in going there. And also um, I think I saw like I've seen the skyline of Doha just like go crazy like like there are a lot of vertical buildings being built like super tall skyscrapers are starting to be uh, starting to be built i think one yeah. i think the re i think the next one i think one of the tallest buildings in the world is going to be in saudi arabia yeah yeah even even that they're trying to build so many vertical buildings yeah saudi Ar saudi arabia is kind of like the new dubai yeah. you're going to see a lot of tall buildings going up in saudi arabia in the coming years um, yeah, for sure. And so I think you're trying to do is capture those tall buildings quicker exactly. before the other. Yeah. All right. So what do you see? Where, so like a final question, like final, like second to final question would be, well, where do you see this going in the next like five, 10 years in terms of hyperlift, like for the company? Yeah. Well, as I said, we expect to be on a beta site by the end of 2023. Um, during 2024, we'll work to get regulatory certification and have our first commercial installation by the end of 2024. So then through 2025, 2026, I see us putting uh, putting our technology onto elevators in the uh, in the New York uh, City market. And then at some point, we will then pivot and begin to uh, develop our our new construction product for the Asia um, or, or yeah, for the Asia and the Middle East market. Right. So I would say within, within five years, we would be hoping to maybe secure our first or first of a few uh, contracts in the Middle East 
to install hyperlift systems in super tall buildings that are being planned there. Got it. And so, yeah, looking forward to seeing how it goes in the next 10 years. I would love to be a part of that. <laughs> yeah, but, yeah, it's going but, to be exciting. <laughs> but just uh, a final question before we wrap up this uh, pro show. Um, well, you know, you've been in this world, you've been in the entrepreneurial engineering and even design space for about 30 plus years now. Like for someone who is going to be following those kinds of footsteps, what advice would you give them? Uh, well, um, I would say one of, one of the most difficult challenges that we've faced so far is, um, is raising funds. Um, and particularly in this, in this, um, economy, right? The economy is not good right now. So, um, you, you know, we kind of have that working against us. The other thing is we're, we're doing hard tech, right? Hard tech is hard, as they say. And most investors today are investing in more simpler things, you know, software things uh, that don't require these big upfront investments, a lot of upfront risks and so forth. So because it's it's really an, it's really an uphill climb, it requires more than anything. It it just requires persistence it, right. and, and a lot of perseverance. You just have to persevere. I mean, I I feel like I feel like many times when i'm out there during the during a day or a week or a month that where i'm out there raising money it's literally feels like get knocked down get up 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 so forth and so on it's like that so if you you got to prepare yourself for that and i've done i've done most of my life i've done um um what they call enterprise sales right so enterprise sales i think all of us know what enterprise sales is Fundraising is much different than enterprise sales. You definitely use skill sets from enterprise sales, but it's a it's a completely different thing raising money. And uh, like I said, more than anything else, it it requires persistence and perseverance. So you got to be prepared for that. Sounds good. All right, cool, uh, James. Thank you so much for coming on the Next in Time podcast. And yeah, I am so looking forward to seeing how Hyperlift really takes off in the next in the next 10, 20 years. Thank you, ST. Appreciate it.